Welcome to the Biotech 2021 conference. I'm Vivek Wadwa. I've been a professor at many universities, uh, uh, you know, Harvard, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford. I mean, I, I'm involved with many projects, do many things, but what I essentially do is I teach about advancing technologies, how everything from artificial intelligence to synthetic biology to quantum computing are now advancing and converging and making the impossible possible. I teach business executives, the, some of the CEOs of billion dollar companies across the globe about how they can make their companies more effective, more productive, and take advantage of advancing technologies. And I teach students about how they can literally solve the grand challenges of humanity. The theme of this year's conference is the mosaic of technologies within biotech and all the opportunities that your students have. It's a wonderful topic but I'm gonna even challenge the conference organizers by taking you one level above biotech and how to, and I'm gonna show you how everything is converging, how a whole range of technologies are converging and how literally everything is becoming biotech. Everything is becoming information and multiple technologies are converging to make the impossible possible. In today's talk, I'm gonna show you what's happening with advancing technologies. I'm gonna show you what's happening within the field of medicine. I'm gonna now, and then I'm gonna show you examples of some world-changing companies that I've been involved with. Literally, how entrepreneurs are trying to solve the grand challenges of humanity and make the world a much better place. This is what I'm gonna focus on in today's lecture. Join me for this. In this lecture, I'm gonna give you a crash course on exponential technologies, convergences, and what they make possible. You know, exponentials is something I used to have to teach a lot, but today we've learned it the hard way because even grandma now is talking about exponential curves. And all of us are sick of seeing charts such as these, exponential growth in the, uh, uh, you know, COVID, uh, virus, exponential death rates. I mean, all of these horrible charts we've been seeing about, about exponentials. So this is horrible, but the good news is that we've all learned what exponentials mean. Now with that, I'm gonna teach you some of the basics anyway, because I think you need to understand what they mean so that you can start planning your future and understanding the opportunities that you have to make the world a better place. First of all, what are exponentials? Well, this is a chart that Peter Diamandis created. What it shows you is what happens when uh, a, something happens linearly versus exponentially. When you take 30 linear steps, how far do you get? About 30 steps away. When you take 30 exponential steps, what does that mean? 30 exponential steps is roughly a billion meters. And you know what a billion meters means? 26 times around the planet. All of us could understand what the 30 linear steps was. It was roughly 30 meters. 30 exponential steps is 26 times around the earth. And this is how technologies are advancing. So just, you know, take exponentials to heart and learn what, what all of this means. Because what's happening is that information technologies are advancing at an exponential rate. Ray Kurzweil, who I consider to be the greatest futurist of our times, I mean, the, uh, he's an Einstein in futurism. Ray Kurzweil has long said that information technologies double in their, uh, in their power, price, performance, capacity, and bandwidth roughly every year. It's a year to two years actually, but. You know, but this is how fast technology is advancing. And what Ray did was that he documented the, the progression of computing over a 110 year period, how we went from electromechanical to integrated circuits. This is how our computers have been advancing exponentially. And this is the history of technology itself, exponential. Look back in time. It took thousands of years to go from agriculture to pottery, to irrigation, to the plow, 
to cities, to metallurgy, to writing, and the peak of Greece and Rome and so on. It took literally thousands of years. So you're talking about you know, dozens of generations of people who experienced practically no change. What's happened over the last 100 years? We have had advance after advance after advance. You know, have you heard that story about the frogs in the water? <laughs> I don't know. I hope no one's ever done it. No one's ever been that cruel to frogs. I know you folks might be still be dissecting frogs, but it's like being a frog in the water that you don't feel the change happening until it's too late, until you become soup. That is how we humans are, that we do not seem to understand the exponential pace of progress. You know, I've been in debates with, um, with people who argue that innovation is dead, that nothing is happening. And I look at them and I say, what a bunch of idiots you are. <laughs> you are the frogs in the water. We have had more advance over the last hundred years than we had since the beginning of humankind. We've had more advances in technology over the last 10 or 20 years than we had in the past 100 years. We will have more advances in technology over the next decade than we have had over the last 100 years. Try to understand that. In this decade, in the 2020s, we hear some of the things we're going to see. We're going to see cars that fly. Well, they may not technically be cars, they may be drones but we're gonna have drones transporting human beings from point A to point B. You're already seeing some of these startups in, in places such as Dubai and, and, and other parts of the world, drone-based transportation. What's more, drones are gonna be delivering our morning latte to us. So we're gonna go on our app, we're gonna click a button, and we're gonna have uh, uh, you know, Starbucks deliver our morning latte to our backyards within about 10 or 15 minutes or so. We're gonna see cars that drive themselves. We already see some of those. I have a Tesla and when I go on to, I live in Silicon Valley. When I go on Route 280, I put it into autopilot and the car drives itself. It automatically changes lanes when I click on the signal and it automatically watches everything that's around us. But soon, those cars will be taking us from point A to point B. We will have the ability to cure cancer and every disease. I'm gonna be talking more about that in this lecture because I'm trying to focus it on biotechnology as much as I can. We're going to now be able to double the production of, of uh, food. We're going to have vertical farms. We're going to have all sorts of amazing advances happening within this decade. And I'm saying this for the second or third time now. My hope is that all of you are going to be leading these advances because you can. All right, so let me give you some examples of these technologies. Let's start with something that's near and dear to all of your hearts which is medicine. I'm sorry, before I do that, let me you know, put things into perspective. Let's talk about some of the technologies that are advancing. It is everything from artificial intelligence to, to 3D printing, to robotics, to virtual reality, to networks, synthetic biology, genomics. All of these technologies are advancing and they're converging. What does convergence means? mean? What convergence means is that you have one plus one equaling 11. When you have AI and robots coming together with sensors, three technologies converging, you have the ability to develop the self-driving cars that I just talked about. When you have networks and nanotechnologies coming together, you get all sorts of other crazy inventions. When you have genomics and synthetic biology coming together, you get the ability to re-engineer humankind. This is what convergences mean. And again, the theme of this conference is the mosaic because you're also seeing convergences within the life sciences. You have bioscience, bioengineering, and biotechnology coming together to make possible genomics and proteomics and, and uh, therapeutics. All sorts of crazy convergences happening. And one of the things I want to leave you with uh, in this lecture is that don't be narrowly focused. Don't be focused just on the advances that are happening in your fields because it's very, you know, in, in academia, and I'm gonna be slightly disrespectful to my colleagues who are teaching you about these advances, they focus very narrowly on their fields of expertise. But the magic happens when you have multiple 
fields coming together. So look outside the distinct fields you're at into other fields. All of you need to learn artificial intelligence. All of you need to learn about what sensors make possible. All of you need to learn about what's happening in synthetic biology. All of you need to understand what's happening in, in telco. Why in telco? Because everything is becoming information, everything is becoming data. And data is captured via the telco, via 5G, via all of these other advances. So you have lots of things happening at the same time. And when they come together, that's when the magic happens. With that, now let me finally get into what I was talking about before, the future of medicine. Let's look at what's happening over here. First of all, I mean, this is not a surprise to you. This is going to be a surprise to your professors and to your parents and to the old people who are watching this. Apple now is in the business of technology. Sorry, is in the business of medicine. It's in the business of selling medical devices. Go to the Apple store and you'll see all sorts of medical devices there. Previous generation, the people like me could never have imagined that a company founded by Steve Jobs, the ultimate tech geek, would be developing medical devices. But guess what? That's what the Apple Watch is. It's a medical device. And Apple has many, many other ambitions in medicine because Apple, like Google, like Microsoft, and like a bunch of other technology companies, sees the opportunities in a multi-trillion dollar industry, which is medicine. So information technology and medicine are merging and the tech industry has its sights on it. This is why Apple is selling you all of these medical devices. Again, you know, the theme of the conference is mosaic biotech. What I'm saying to you is forget biotech. It's biocomputing, biotech, you know, or take biotech up a level. Start thinking about computing being part of this. Start thinking about all of the other uh, technologies, sensors, MEMS-based sensors being part of it. And now you begin to see how Apple is thinking because what's happening is that we're now taking everything from electronic medical records to sensor data and now telemedicine as it happens, home health monitoring, and everything is becoming technology based. The tech industry wants to eat medicine. Memorize that, that phrase, because what's happening is that with all of these devices, we're gathering massive amounts of data, 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 data everywhere. Uh, your smartphones, these devices that you carry in your hands, they're, monitor they're the greatest spying devices ever built. They're monitoring your emotions. How, do, how can a smartphone gather your emotions? Because when you talk on it, you're able to, it's now able to recognize whether you're stressed, whether you're happy, whether you're sad. That comes from your voice. Okay. Relationships. Who do you talk to most? You know, Facebook has become the modern day big brother. It's spying on us. It's an evil corporation now. I used to be a big fan of Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Now I talk about Mark Zuckerberg being Darth Vader. Why? Because Mark Zuckerberg is capturing every amount of information he can about us everywhere we go. So Mark Zuckerberg knows who you like, who you dislike, who you, t who you talk to. You know, he's capturing all this information. Um, um, sleep. These devices can also tell when we're asleep because they can hear your snoring. So they're capturing that data. They're able to capture your daily activity. Why? Because we, ca we take these devices with us when we go to the bathrooms. <laughs> yes, I know you do it. You take this with you everywhere, uh, just in case you were, able, you were you miss out on a text from a friend of yours. So you're taking it everywhere. So this device is ca capturing your your, um, your your lifestyle, your activities. Everything you do is being captured about you. It's your stress levels. Uh, all sorts of data is being captured about you. Vital signs are being captured. So we're getting data, 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 data. And what do you do with data? You analyze it. And how do you analyze it? You use artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is the ability to recognize patterns in information. AI isn't magic. All this BS that you've heard about, you know, super intelligence and all of that, it is exactly what I just said it is, BS. AI is pattern recognition. 
what you do with data is that you with what you do with artificial intelligence is that you create a model for what you think that data is. You give the AI model very various examples, and then you turn it loose. You're saying, okay, analyze this data. So the reason why AI is so effective at analyzing uh, uh, pictures, the fact that you know you, they can recognize faces now, is because we've been dumb enough to upload all of our photographs to Instagram, to Facebook, and to all of these public sites, and we've been labeling them. We've been telling Mark Zuckerberg and his peers exactly who's in the picture and what exactly the picture is. So there are trillions, trillions upon trillions of now data on, um, um, you know, in our photographs. So the algorithms necessary to recognize what's in the picture have been trained. That's what AI is, pattern recognition. So now we're also gathering all of these data I talked about in medicine. So guess what? AI has, has, has developed the ability to start recognizing these, recognizing these data. And soon, when I say soon, within this decade roughly, AI will exceed the capabilities of our doctors to understand the data. Because when you have so much data being gathered, our doctors, when you, you know, what happens when you go to a doctor? The doctor, you know, takes your pulse. The doctors will, will put a stethoscope on you and listen to your heartbeat, ask you some dumb questions, and then prescribe a life-changing medicine to you. The doctor isn't looking at your genetic sequence. The doctor isn't looking at your, um, uh, your lifestyle and habits. The doctor doesn't know who you're close to. He doesn't, the doctor doesn't know who your stress, what your stress levels are. The doctor doesn't have all of the information I just put up on the screen for you. And, and what happens then? So the doctor is acting based on very limited knowledge, very limited data. What's the AI doing? The AI is able to analyze all of this information about you and, help, and will help you make better decisions than your doctor can. That's in the 2020s that this will become possible. So we have an amazing and scary future ahead because of all of the data that we have and what artificial, artificial intelligence can do and because of the convergences all of these technologies. So this was at the physical level, I talked about what was happening. We also have a revolution happening in genomics. You know, in the year 2000, that's probably about the time many of you were born or give or take a few years. Uh, in the year 2000, uh, there was a race between a scientist and Craig Venter, uh, uh, between a scientist Craig Venter and the US government to sequence the human genome. Altogether, the efforts cost about $2.75 billion. Craig Venter, uh, you know, so I don't know how he got this, but he spent about $100 million and he took government data and he beat the US government to the punch in sequencing the human genome. So roughly it cost about $3 billion to sequence the human genome. Today, you can do the same thing for 500 bucks or so, give or take, you know, a couple of hundred dollars. That's what human genome sequencing costs. At the pace at which this is progressing, by the end of this decade, or even sooner than that, to do a complete human genome will cost less than a buck. It'll cost less than a cup of coffee. And we'll probably have an app and uh, an attachment to our iPhone that can sequence anything we want. This is how genomics is progressing. So what does that make po uh, possible? Remember I talked about curing cancer? Guess what? We'll not only be able to cure cancer, we'll be able to cure every disease. No, I'm not crazy. Let me show you some, something which is mind blowing to me. That curing disease is simply a data problem. Because what is disease? Disease is a bunch of symptoms. I mean, uh, it's, I, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I should be more precise over here. Disease is manifested by a bunch of symptoms, okay? And, and then, um, you know, uh, how many symptoms are there? Just think about it. How many symptoms can you have? You have a tummy ache, you have a headache, you have a backache, you have a, a, a pain in your butt. <laughs> think about all the symptoms you could possibly have of something being wrong with you. There are only a few hundred symptoms. How many diseases are there? A few thousand, a few hundred. I mean, not, not that many. 
And what scientists have found is that symptoms, diseases, genes, and proteins are all linked. And there are roughly, you know, a couple of hundred thousand uh, uh, connections between these. So what's a couple of hundred thousand uh, uh, connections for, for AI? It's, you know, jump change, it's baby stuff. Curing disease, once we have all of the data, once we have all of the genetic data and all of the lifestyle information, all the data we're gathering, is a simple problem for AI. It's, you know, for a computer, it's as simple as an Excel spreadsheet is. That, that's what AI is. It's Excel spreadsheets on steroids. Once we get these data, which will happen within this, this decade, we will have the ability to find what causes diseases. And disease isn't simply a matter of, uh, you know, taking medicines. It's also a matter of lifestyle and habits and a whole bunch of things. It's our genes, our proteins, you folks are experts in this, but it's a data problem. And soon with data, we will be able to cure these diseases. Now, this might sound, sound crazy, but uh, you know, look at what happened with COVID. Remember I started this lecture with, with COVID? Do you know how long it took to come up with a vaccine for COVID? It took 48 hours. I'm not kidding. Do your own research on this, read, read up on this. It took you know, about six decades to build the mRNA platforms that Moderna, um, you know, Pfizer and uh, a couple of other companies used to develop the COVID vaccines. But once they had the genomic sequence of the, um, uh, you know, deadly disease, it took Moderna only 48 hours to come up with, with the version one of the COVID vaccine. It took several months for them to test it but that's the way you know uh, our clinical trials go. And in a different lecture, I'll, I'll tell you one day about all of the advances that are happening, which will help us accelerate all of the testing of uh, uh, of uh, you know these new therapies, immunotherapies, all of the things that are happening, because we'll be able to accelerate that as well. In the future, I'm talking about, we'll be able to uh, take genomic data and find treatments for the new pandemics as they come up. And we'll, within days, we'll be able to develop vaccines that are very effective or full-fledged full treatments. This is the amazing future we're headed into, again, that I want all of you to participate in. Start learning these technologies I'm talking about. Go to my website, wadwa.com, read some of my articles, go and read books on it. I'm going to recommend two books at the end of this lecture. But start learning about all this stuff because this is the future all of you can participate in and make impossible things possible. Right now, let's switch gears and talk about another interesting technology called synthetic biology. What is synthetic biology? Synthetic biology is playing God with the universe. <laughs> That's what this is all about. So, um, you know, um, most of you are in, in uh, are, are young in your twenties, maybe a few thirty-year-olds, and and some old people like me watching this video. But you know the, who the most exciting synthetic biologists are? Children, <laughs> your younger brothers and sisters. Let me show you, uh, you know, something I'm very excited about, which is the iGEM, co iGEM competition. And I'll bet you most of you don't know about it. What I want you to do is to start listening, start watching what these kids out of school are doing. Watch this. Genetically engineered machine competition. Groups of primarily undergraduates get together and they identify some cool projects that they might do using synthetic biology techniques, using particular types of pieces of DNA, and they try to make something. I think iGEM and synthetic biology in general has this art-like character where the possibilities are endless. Uh, iGEM has really helped me put failure in perspective. When you read about science, it's usually like, oh, we discovered this, we made this. But behind the scenes, there's actually a lot of failure that goes on. And really, I guess iGEM has taught me to take those failures and make something out of them. We're all teammates, we're all at the same level. There's no sense of seniority or hierarchy, which is a very refreshing take on working in a team. When push comes to shove, if you're just really excited about your own science, but you don't get it out to other people, then it doesn't mean anything. So that's what iGEM is about, to share your work with others and to hear what they have to say as well. You do your own Googling to learn about iGEM. It's really cool stuff. And those kids are younger than all of you, all of you are. If they're doing all of these amazing things, if, if they're learning about failure and experimentation and uh, doing all of this cool stuff, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> right? <laughs> My heroes. Well, as all of you know, we can now edit DNA. 
This is what CRISPR is about, and there are whole sorts of advances happening in CRISPR. And this is making crazy things possible, which make, get me very excited and very scared at the same time. Because, you know, for the last, um, you know, eight to 10 years, we've been doing all sorts of crazy things with it. I mean, as far back as 2015, the Chinese had done experiments on pigs to create micro pigs. They create these, created these supersized beagles and so on. This terrifies me because this is an abuse of technology. And, and again, we'll talk, you know, I'll get back, get back and tell you why I'm worried about this. But the fact is that this is possible. CRISPR mosquitoes is something that Bill Gates has been very excited about. I'm trying to engineer out mosquitoes, but this also is worrisome because what happens if something goes wrong and we create monster mosquitoes. God knows what we could do with this stuff. But if, when done correctly, incredible opportunities here. We have to be very careful. CRISPR food and flowers. This has been going on for years. We could create super hardy you know, vegetables, uh, you know, uh, fruit that grows in the middle of a desert, uh, plants that are resistant, resistant to flooding. I mean, all sorts of amazing things that you kids could be, you know, that you folks can be doing with CRISPR-based technologies. Um, you know, provided you do it ethically, because this is what terrifies me. They were also now experimenting with CRISPR on humans. I mean, you, you read about what happened in China uh, when, when um, uh, you know, we had these crazy scientists uh, uh, experimenting with humans. Uh, the Chinese disclaimed all knowledge of this thing, but they were f actively funding it. I'm terrified about uh, some of the work China is doing on, uh, on um, you know, gene editing on humans because there are dire risks of altering the human germline in it. Because this is what really worries me, is that we don't know where to draw the line. You know, if we have the ability to uh, uh, edit out disease, that's wonderful. If we have the ability to, to edit in intelligence, well, is that good or bad? I mean, think about it. You're going to be, you know, many of you are going to be parents over, through, over the next few years. If you had a child and you had the option of, um, of um, uh, removing all the hereditary, hereditary diseases from your child, I think it would be a no-brainer. We'd say, yeah, let's do it. But then, you know, your uh, geneticist comes to you and says, hey, would you like to add some IQ points? Huh? IQ points? Well, do you want to add 10 IQ points, 20 IQ points, 100 IQ points? And what happens when we start adding IQ points to our children? Well, first of all, it becomes a competition who's going to have the smartest children. But at what point do we now cross the ethical line and start creating monsters? Because we don't know what the impact of uh, IQ is. I mean, um, you know, humanity is, is fine with its imperfections. I mean, yes, we need to uh, be nicer to each other and we're doing evil and all of that stuff. But... Does intelligence lead to better human beings? I don't know. I want you to be, to be researching this and I want you to be thinking about it. Where do you draw the freaking line when it comes to using um, CRISPR on human beings? And then think about some of the other applications of CRISPR because uh, you know, an amazing scientist, George Church of Harvard, has been doing some incredible work to tr bring back the woolly mammoth. He's working with a bunch of Russian scientists and now they're talking about resurrecting the woolly mammoth. It's wonderful because if we can now repopulate the Russian tundra and uh, you know squat and and crush the snow, yes, we will be able to possibly reduce <laughs> global warming. That's what these folks want to do. But are we ready for this? Because the next thing that happens is that. We're now talking about bringing back dinosaurs. So far, we haven't been able to do it. But a few days ago, uh, the Chinese scientists announced that they had found some DNA. Because until recently, we didn't, you know, with the woolly mammoth, what George Church's group had to do was to take the DNA of, uh, of you know, uh, I think it was African elephants. And then they started uh, taking some of the data that they had on the woolly mammoth and trying to experiment and do it. It, was, it took them a lot longer because they didn't have the full genetic sequence. But guess what? Read up on this. Chinese scientists seem to have found the genetic code of the raptors. If, uh, I'm sure all of you have seen um, uh, Jurassic Park. The raptors? 
well, guess what? We may be able to bring back the raptors. And we may try to, you know, uh, limit this to some, some uh, raptors in cages in uh, our labs. But if you saw Jurassic Park, if you haven't seen Jurassic Park, go back and see it. It wasn't a happy ending. And that is what I'm afraid we could do with it. All right, so, uh, you know, I, I scared myself over here with this lecture. But let's switch gears and I'll talk, start talking about the positive. Let's talk about solving the grand challenges of humanity because I'm going to show you what some incredible scientists are doing to solve the grand challenges of humanity. And, and I'm going to step outside biotech over here, the biotech definition you have, but to me, everything is a technology right now and everything is a biotech. So let me switch gears and talk about solving humanity's grand challenges because this is what it's all about. One of the biggest problems we have is clean water. Something like 80% of the infectious diseases in the world are caused by bad water. We're talking about water shortages, and we, I mean, it's crazy. This is a waterborne planet, and all it takes to have clean water is to boil the freaking water. Yet, we have you know, children dying of, of, of waterborne diseases every minute, practically. It's really sad. There have been virtually no breakthroughs in clean water for about 60 years or so. What's wrong with us? I mean, uh, all of this, the great scientific experiments that you folks are doing in your, in your labs, all of the money that our universities have, and there's been no major breakthrough in water technologies for decade upon decade upon decade. So yes, we have UV, we have uh, reverse osmosis, but that's decades old technology. That's, that's as primitive as you know, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Well, guess what? There are solutions at hand. And then we talk about water shortages. You know, if you want an extraterrestrial looking at the discussions we're having about the planet drying up and the, you know, the, the, the desert, you think that these human beings were crazy. 71% of the Earth's surface is water, yet we talk about water shortages. So now I'm going to take you to Chile to show you a technology that, that one of the greatest scientists of this, of the, you know, of, of present day, Alfredo Zalezi, has done. The company is AIC, Advanced Innovation Center. You can just Google, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, Google Alfredo Zolezi, Z-O-L-E-Z-Z-I, and learn about him because he's made some breakthroughs using a team of a dozen people or so in Santiago, Chile. I'm going to show you some of his technologies and what he's done with it. The guy, literally, um, um, uh, Einstein and Edison. Edison, from what I've read, it wasn't uh, a good human being. He was obsessed with making money. That's why I don't call Alfredo uh, uh, and, uh, um, and Edison. I call him an Einstein because he's pure genius. But he has the the um, um, the innovative capability, uh, the uh, innovative capability of Edison, and I'm going to show you some of this guy's inventions. First of all, uh, a solution to the world's water, uh, clean water problem. Watch this video. The technology is called PWS, Plasma Water Sanitation System. The plasma water sanitation system takes in a continuous flow of contaminated water and injects it under high pressure into a plasma reaction chamber. As pressure drops inside due to acceleration, the liquid stream transforms into a biphasic gas-liquid flow. An electric field is applied to the biphasic flow, transforming it into non-thermal plasma, destroying all virus and bacteria in the water. As velocity decreases, pressure increases, turning the flow back into liquid which is then released from the chamber, delivering clean, safe, and reliable water in a continuous flow. So what did I just show you over here? What was this technology I was just talking about? Let me, let me you know, um, switch cameras and, and give you some background information here. Alfredo Zolesi was a petroleum engineer. He lived in, um, in Santiago, Chile. He went to the slums nearby, and he was shocked at what he was seeing, that in a country such as Chile, People were getting sick because of unclean water. It really touched Alfred. He says, what am I doing trying to make money with my petroleum technologies? I want to do good for the world. So he repurposed some of the research he was doing in trying to find a new way of um, cleaning water. If, you know, um, again, you're, 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 you're in biotech. This is all biotech to me, by the way. So don't think that this is not your, your field. It is because everything ultimately is coming together. So what he said was that, look, um, uh, what can I do to the water to kill everything living in it? And he read some papers on plasma. What is plasma? Plasma is the fourth state of matter. 
the sun is plasma lightning is plasma so what it uh, you know started doing was researching what will it take to con to convert water into plasma and back into water and he developed that crazy technology i i told you about i met him about a decade ago when i went to chile and he showed me a prototype of this of this technology and i was completely blown away um it used less energy in it than a hair dryer about 1500 1700 watts that's about what what a hair dryer uses and he was able to to develop a 100% clean cleaning uh, drinking water out of that i went and i visited the the uh, the slum where he was doing it and the villagers told me that uh, that uh, they weren't falling sick anymore it's so much so that the uh, that the hospital nearby came to visit them to say what's wrong why aren't you visiting us anymore they said because we're not getting sick anymore because we have clean water now this was what alfredo zolesi and a bunch and a, and a handful of engineers that he had working with him created in a year or two of work and then he started rolling this out so let me uh, switch back to the other mode and sh and he rolled out um, the uh, um, one second he rolled out um, um, you know the pws uh, um, uh, um, the president of chile basically you know um, um, rolled out a production version of this in 2016 so it was incredible what he what what uh, what uh, you know one scientist and his team of people had achieved in chile and then they started miniaturizing it and developing all sorts of new technologies and then airbus came along and said hey can we put this on our airplane because you know if you've ever traveled on an airplane you know that the water in it is the dirtiest you'll get on it's as bad as the slums the water on the airplanes is horrible the bacteria count because of uh, you know the way these planes work it's just absolutely horrible so they miniaturized these units and they created these little you know small suitcase size units that can be on airplanes so this is what alfred has been up to but a big problem happened during the pandemic that suddenly the airbus project stopped he was working with siemens everything stopped and alfredo had nothing to do i mean his company was almost in bankruptcy so he went back to basics and said you know what else can i do with my technology i have the ability to transfer to transform water into plasma what else can i do with water so he said let's see if i can solve another, another grand challenge of humanity what's this grand challenge it's food it's hunger you know um, um there's a lot happening in um, um in, in food i'm going to get back to alfredo but first i want to tell you about some of the incredible things that are happening in uh, in solving this grand challenge because first of all this is again something that uh, you folks should learn about and 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 look at it's the ability to produce the 3d print meat yes 3d print meat essentially uh, produce it in vitro that um, we essentially uh, over the next 5 or 7 years or so it will be cheaper to synthetically produce meat than to kill animals this is going to help with global warming because a lot of the uh, uh, the pollution and the uh, uh, you know earth warming is coming from from uh, from uh, the greenhouse gases that we use use in in um, storing animals amazing things happening in this field again learn about this thing and then you have vertical farming we we essentially grow food in buildings incredible uh, uh, you know uh, uh, scientific things happening in um, in being able to grow food in uh, in vertical farms again read up on this stuff because this is another field that all of you should be looking at and learning about because we can improve productivity we can feed the planet using uh, these techniques in vertical farming and and there are a lot of breakthroughs that are still needed in this so it's an opportunity for you to apply your biotech knowledge to growing food and feeding the planet big big opportunity trillion dollar opportunity for us to get this right and now let's get back to my friend um, alfredo zolesi because as i said he went back to basics and he says well what if i can produce plasma activated water what the hell is plasma activated water plasma activated water is how mother nature nurtures and protects the the flora on this planet you know when all this lightning hits lightning as i said is a fourth state of matter in the air is nitrogen when you have plasma and nitrogen coming together you get nitrates what are nitrates nitrates are fertilizer and you get nit and you get reactive nitrogen species and then when when um, the same lightning walk goes through the oxygen 
it adds a molecule to the H2O2. It becomes H2O2. And this is a quiz for you. What's H2O2? Hydrogen peroxide. What's hydrogen peroxide? Hydrogen peroxide is um, a disinfectant. It's, it also has some other magical powers I'll tell you about. Because what Alfredo realized was that the same technology he had used to clean water could be used to now to create plasma activated water. And what can plasma activated water be used for? Is to create a natural fertilizer. Because what happens over here is that uh, H2O2, this was my quiz for you. I hope you all of you got this right and you answered the question properly. Because as you should know, H2O2 breaks down biofilms and kills bacteria. This is why it's a disinfectant. It also increases the antimicrobial uh, responses. You know, just like when, uh, you know, I mean, how immunotherapy works in our bodies, how vaccines work, that you attack, you know, the body and it, the body builds natural defenses. Well, guess what? H2O2 also, also, uh, also, also triggers a, a hypersensitive response in plants. So they start building the equivalent of their vaccines to fight, uh, you know, disease. So plasma activated water, PAW, contains reactive oxygen species that uh, induce antioxidants. And it's like the superfoods <laughs> into plants. It's almost magical what, uh, what this stuff can do. Because now suddenly we're talking about, um, uh, you know, green technologies uh, being produced from this plasma activated water. Uh, by the way, what I didn't tell you was how much this technology costs. Those boxes I showed you, the Airbus type of boxes, enough to clean up enough uh, water for a village or to provide uh, plasma activated water for an entire uh, small farm, cost a few thousand dollars. The electricity, it's actually less than the uh, hair dryer, less than a thousand watts now. Six, seven hundred watts are some of the units that are achieving, which means that you could have two solar panels now powering these devices that cost a few thousand dollars, which can provide not only clean water, but which can also provide uh, uh, plasma activated water for the village. This was by, done by one genius, good hearted scientist and a team of en his engineers, brilliant engineers who really care about humanity. Why am I telling you this? Because what are you folks, what are you folks doing, waste, doing, wasting your lives trying to uh, join some big, you know, pharma companies or biotech companies and you graduate? Why don't you come together and solve problems like what Alfred is doing? <laughs> now, before I get off this topic, here's another technology that Alfred happened to discover on his, uh, <laughs> on his journey that he could also do real time, uh, 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 you know, uh, qu uh, water quality monitoring with it. Remember the chart I showed, the uh, video I showed you where uh, water was passed through a tube? There was light being generated that in plasma. Plasma is, is a form of light. Lightning is light. Well, guess what? What happens if you put a sensor on it? You know, I, I keep talking about convergences. Add another, another technology to this mix, which is a camera, a sensor. The same freaking cameras that your phones have, except the best camera you could possibly get. Look at the light using that and then use machine learning to analyze it. And what you realize is that you can now look at everything that's happening within that water stream. Um, you know, when, when you folks want to uh, test the contents of water, what do you do? You take a sample of the water, you send it to a lab, and then they do a spectroscopic analysis of it and give you back a report of what's in the water. Okay, here's the iron level, here's the lead level, chromium level, God knows what other impurities are in the water. With this device that Alfredo has, in continuous flow, you can look at exactly what's in the water. So imagine now having a miniaturized version of this in your home in which you can come to your uh, smartphone and watch the, uh, what's happening in the water that you're about to drink. So you know the exact lead level, you know the exact calcium level, uh, I, you know, you folks know better than I do what's in the water in our, in our, in our taps. But imagine if you could do that uh, uh, dynamically. That is exactly what a federal solution can do. That's exactly what this uh, uh, plasma uh, spectrum analysis provides. Real time, 
The same cost as what I talked about before, a few thousand dollars for these units. And by the time they're done, it'll cost, because again, again go back to the chart I showed you about Ray Kurzweil and exponential technologies. The cost keeps dropping exponentially. So now we're talking about uh, 100, 200 dollar devices. I'm, I'm moving forward a few years, uh, which cost a few hundred dollars, uh, cost a hundred dollars, 150 dollars, which you have in your houses, just like those filters that you have, you have an add-on to them, which now tells you exactly what's in the water. This is what Alfredo developed. And by the way, it can also be used for industry, for analyzing what goes in um, uh, industrial processes, and it can be used for monitoring the stuff that's in wastewater. This is another problem we have. All right, so that was one friend I talked about, Alfredo Zalezi. Now let me take you to India to tell you about solving another problem, diagnostics. This is another biotechnology, because you, you folks are lucky where we live in North America, we have access to you know, doctors, hospitals, anytime we get sick, we can get diagnosed. But in the rest of the world, people don't have access to diagnostics. Even diagnosing COVID is a nightmare. What if you could do this inexpensively? Well, here's an, another entrepreneur, Ramanan Lakshminarayan, um, and working with a team of scientists there who developed a device that looks like what you're seeing on the screen, which can do the same tests as you do in hospitals. Everything from, uh, you know, uh, blood grouping, hemoglobin, cholesterol, 12 ADKGs. What does this device cost? About a thousand bucks. What's the problem with our medical system? That to get diagnosed, it's like the water I talked about. You take a sample, send it to the doctor. So you go to the doctor, the doctor puts those stupid stethoscopes on you, listens to you. And then, of course, the doctor is going to order a blood test to cover his or her butt. So that, um, uh, you know, in case something isn't diagnosed, um, the doctor doesn't get into trouble. So they send it away to the lab. Days later, you get your results back. And what happens then is that uh, we get fed up of it. We, you know, we lose interest so that it takes too long to get diagnosed. And therefore, you know, we get worse. With this device called HealthCube, it takes a few minutes to get instant diagnosis. I'm going to show you another video. This is Mrs. Rajasree Birla. My Indian friends who are watching this know who she is because the Birlas are um, one of the, uh, the, you know, uh, the greatest families in India. Mrs. Birla is a philanthropist, a wonderful, wonderful human being. And she's been taking this across India. Watch this video. At IDEA, we have evolved the social entrepreneur model embedding the health cube. We are able to reach out to rural areas, including labor migrants, and offer them a path to proactive wellness. Timely health screening and diagnostics on 32 related tests, including all pathological tests, blood sugar, hemoglobin, blood pressure, and many more issues are diagnosed before they turn into a major illness. We have created an army of village social entrepreneurs who do the health screening at a very nominal cost. We have taken Health Cube to Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Kerala, and Andhra Pradesh, collectively spanning 20 districts and 100 locations. In all these, we have seen a palpable change, healthier people, fewer illnesses, and a general sense of well being. This is a convergence of sensors because there's no magic in this. Uh, this is not uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, you know, one drop of blood and all this BS. What Ramanan did was to take off the shelf sensors, integrate them into one device and make it inexpensive using advancing technologies. This is what is possible. This is what I want all of you folks to be doing is to coming up with amazing ideas like this and making the world a better place. So I'm going to conclude my lecture over here with some lessons for you. What I'd like you to be thinking about and what I think is really important. Because what I see now is technology being used for good and technology being used for evil. I already gave you some examples of the things I'm worried about. You know, I talked about how CRISPR could be used for good. It could be used for evil. I talked about social media, um, Zuckerberg, who I used to think was good, now I think is evil because that is what the problem with every technology is. That at the same time, it can do good and it can do bad. And I see two futures happening at the exact same time. 
this is what terrifies me and gets me excited at the same time. I feel like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde half the time because both of these happen at the same time. What are these both of these? Well, watch this. As the world fell, space, the final frontier was broken. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. So we have good and we have evil at the same time. We have Star Trek. I mean, uh, if you haven't, folks haven't seen it, go and watch it because it's a vision of mankind, humankind. I mean, mankind used to be what uh, we said in the 1960s. Now it's humankind. I got to be correct over here because I have a book about the role of women in technology, innovating women, which talks about why women are the future and how women are going to lead us into this amazing future we're headed into. Read it, my friends, because um, it's, you know, um, both men and women have a role in the future. And I think women have the compassion and the heart to really uh, take us to the Star Trek future. Because you have, you know, the ability now to rip, the, rip society apart and do evil and you have the ability to do good at the same time. And it's really the choices we make that are going to determine what the outcome is. Because with every technology, we've got to decide whether it has the potential to benefit everyone equally. If the rich have a technology and the poor don't, guess what happens? The poor end up killing the rich. That, watch any science fiction movie and you'll see that common theme in it. And then do the rewards outweigh the risks? CRISPR, I challenge you to think about it. Talk about it, think about it. I mean, is it worth doing all of this or is it not worth it? You decide. And then does it promote autonomy or dependence? I talked about self-driving cars. The question is, do we want to be dependent on self-driving cars to take us everywhere and to be spying on us? Good and bad at the same time. I'm going to leave you with some reading. You know, I wouldn't be a professor if I wasn't giving you homework. I want you to read at least one book and hopefully two books. The one book you must read is Driving the Driverless Car because it walks you through all of these technologies. I only had, you know, 50 minutes to, to walk you through the advancing technologies, but this book, Driving the Driverless Car, teaches you about all of these technologies, everything from AI to computing sensors, um, uh, you know, uh, quantum computing, all of these advances that are happening. And then it posits that we have the choice between a Star Trek future and a Mad Max. It walks you through the choices we must make. So this is mandatory reading for all of you. And the next one is for those of you who want to start companies. If you want to learn the secrets of Silicon Valley, why is it that Silicon Valley leads the world in innovation and has the most innovative companies in the world? Then watch, then read this book from Incremental to Exponential. But you'll learn a lot from bo both of these books. With that, I'm going to conclude my lecture and wish you the best. and and hope that you listen to me and, to, and think about uh, making you know, humankind uh, uh, better and, and taking us into the future of Star Trek. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.